OK, so what would a supernova explosion do to a planet? Well, let's say we have a supernova, a star that goes supernova. These put out a power that can be up to about 10 to the 44 joules. Well, that's the energy, so that's the total power integrated over the time. Supernova will be bright for a few weeks, so if you add up the power over all that time, that's the sort of total energy you get out. And let's say we have a planet some distance d, let's say about 10 to the 11 meters, but less than an astronomical unit. And let's say it's a rocky planet, so it's got a radius of about, um, well, the Earth's got 6,000 kilometers, let's make it a bit bigger than the Earth, so 10,000 kilometers, so it's 10 to the 4, 5, 6, 7, about 10 to the 7 meters in radius. There's no point in trying to calculate it totally precisely, we're just after a rough uh, figure to see whether it's even feasible that a planet could survive if it's out by many orders of magnitude then the odd factor of two doesn't matter. If it comes out as being close then we might have to go back and look at the calculation in more detail. Okay so there are going to be two steps to the calculation. The first step is what fraction of this power actually hits the planet and the second is what would that energy do to the planet. So let's look at the fraction that's hitting the planet. Let's draw an imaginary sphere of radius d around the supernova. Most of the radiation will just go straight through and out into space, but the bit that lands here will hit. So you can imagine replacing the planet with a disk of radius r facing the star, which therefore has an area of pi r squared. The total surface area of this whole sphere is 4 pi d squared. So the fraction of the energy, the total energy, that hits the fraction of energy is going to be this area here divided by the total area. So pi r squared over 4 pi d squared. So if we call the total energy E, energy absorbed by planet, it's going to be roughly E, the pi's cancel here, times E over 4, R over D squared. So how much is that? So if we assume that um, the total energy is about 10 to the 44 joules, so that's going to be about 10 to the 44 over 4, and we've got about 10 to the 7 meter radius planet, about 10 to the 11 meters away. So, this, so that's all squared, so that's 10 to the minus 4, so, to the, so when you're squared it's 10 to the minus 8, so take 8 off that, so it's about equal to a quarter. 10 to the 44 minus 8 orders of magnitude is going to be about 10 to the 36. So that is a lot of energy. But planets are big. So the mass of the Earth is about 6 by 10 to the 24 kilograms. Let's assume this is a bit bigger, so uh, maybe three or four times bigger, like the pulsar planets. So that gives us uh, a mass of the planet about, you know, say, 2 by 10 to the 25 kilograms. So we compare this with that. We get a energy Uh, unit mass <coughs> twiddles 1 over 4 times 10 to the 36 all over 2 by 10 to the 25 so that's about 1 8 10 times 10 to the 11 which is pretty much 10 to the 10 per kilogram. 
So that's a lot of joules for every kilogram on the planet. Now this course may not be totally realistic. Uh, it, a lot of the energy of the, of the supernova is in neutrinos that might go straight through the planet. Some of it might be in the, the blast wave, which might curve in some fluid dynamical way around the planet. So it could well be that the energy that actually impacts the planet is less than this. But it's going to be something like that. So now let's ask, if you did get 10 to the 10 joules added to every kilogram of a planet, what's it going to do? Well, let's say we've got a kilogram of rock. and you add large amounts of energy to it, what's going to happen? Well, the first thing is it'll warm up. So to, let's warm it up to, warm up to the melting point. So the melting point is going to be about uh, 1,000 degrees. Depends on the exact type of rock, might be 2,000. Starting with a temperature somewhere between 0 and 100. So we've got to increase the temperature by about roughly 1,000 Kelvin. The energy needed to do that is the change in temperature times the specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity for rock is about a thousand. Specific heat capacity for rock is about a thousand joules per kilogram. So to bring the rock up to the melting point, you're going to need about a thousand times a thousand. So about 10 to the 6 joules. So that's got it up to the melting point. Now to melt it, we need the latent heat of fusion. This is the energy needed to convert a kilogram of a solid at the melting point temperature to a kilogram of liquid at the melting point temperature. It's basically going into breaking the bonds. Now I don't know what that is for rock. Um, so let's assume it's about the same as water, which is about uh, 300, roughly 300 kilojoules, 300,000 joules per kilogram. That's to turn ice into water. And it's going to be roughly the same for rock. It might be five times smaller or five times bigger, but about the same. That sort of five times factor doesn't really matter here. So to convert our kilogram, we're going to need about, so that's about three times 10 to the five joules. So less than that. Then we've got to raise it by another temperature difference to bring it up to the boiling point. Let's say it boils, I've no idea what temperature rock boils, I've never seen rock boiling, but let's say it boils at 2000 degrees. Probably not going to be too far off. So we're going to have to use raise the temperature by another thousand. Let's assume the heat capacity remains the same as it's a liquid, so that's another 10 to the 6 joules. And then we've got to supply the latent heat of vaporization to turn a kilogram of liquid to a kilogram of gas just like uh, it takes the um, energy to turn water at 100 degrees into steam in a kettle now once again i don't know the value of that for rock i haven't tried boiling any rock recently curiously enough but for water it's about 2 by 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram so we'll assume it's about the same so add these all up, and we've got um, about four or say five, sort of five by ten to the six joules needed to turn a kilogram of rock at normal temperature into a kilogram of rock vapor. Now remember, the energy available is ten to the ten. All we need is a few by ten to the six. So that's telling us we have far, far, lots of energy. So the uh, energy supplied is much greater than energy needed to, to vaporize rock. If it was only like two or three times as big, then you might worry about maybe we've left something out, maybe we needed to look up more precisely these values, try melting some rock in the lab. Um, you have to worry about whether you know, the neutrinos are being absorbed, whether the radiation can flow around it. Maybe um, as it starts vaporizing, that will give it a very silvery clouds of vaporized rock that will reflect much of the radiation off. All those things might bring the energy input down by uh, maybe a factor of 10, maybe even a factor of 100. But that's nothing like enough. It would need to be brought down by you know, 2,000 times to save the planet. So it looks like 
and it's